6.03, so you know you're following up uh, Clay and Nancy from last week. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> ah, it was awesome. We just had a cha chance to chat about Chippewa days and kind of back in the day. And, and I, I really had no idea how, um, how much of a 12-meter fan Clay was besides sailing on them. And I know that they really enjoy the 12 meters. It's something that you forget when you're not from New England and didn't grow up in a sailing family that like, well, you know, the 12 meter is like, oh man, it's on the wall. And like, that's like what you want to do, you know? Yeah. Well, that's actually how I met Clay. Like I hadn't met Clay. I'd heard the Chippewa stories and knew of the Chippewa boat, but I met Clay in 2007 when uh, Rob Ouellette, who's actually our COO here with American Magic, he was running Freedom, the 12 meter, which I was working for him on. And Clay actually chartered the boat uh, over in Europe for one of the events, I think it was in Sardinia. And so he ended up chartering the boat and just was a fanatic about the freedom to where he actually found his way back on the boat. I don't think he had chartered it for a second event, but still found his way onto the boat for a second event. And then, yeah, that's how I befriended Clay and ended up doing some of the Chippewa stuff with you actually for a period there before you ended yeah. up taking on, taking on the bandit show. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean that was like delivery days, and yeah, that was a that was a. That's, it's funny how the whole network, and I think that that kind of leads right into a lot of what we talk about in these warrior watches. Is like it's been fun to get friends on, and then kind of go back in time of how we met and how all of the networks are kind of all meshed together. Like, oh yeah, we sit with that guy, and we did that, and how we end up yeah. where we're at, right? And like. I still have this vision when I see myself in the mirror until I open my eyes that, you know, we're still new to Newport and there's like new things going on, but that's actually not very true. Cause when I first met you, uh, Hey, you were, you were a bartender at Zelda's, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, when I moved to Newport, I moved there with the, the hope of opening my own restaurant with slinging drinks being the primary profession and just wanted to get back to a sailing town where I could, you know, sail casually and have that just be a hobby and and now it's uh morphed the opposite direction to where sailing is the profession and drinking is the hobby <laughs> well, that's, and that's, that, that's funny how it works you know i didn't, didn't even know that there was a profession in sailing you know i just wanted to get away no from me neither and be out there and do it but yeah it leads yeah. right into so where where are you from you know that's like the first thing we always start with is where are you from? And we don't even have to talk about sailing. Everyone jumps into how they started sailing, but where, where are you from? No, I'm from Connecticut originally. I mean, it was uh, you know, growing up in a small town called Essex, like, right along the Connecticut River. And getting out on the water was just a natural part of growing up there. Uh, but then I bounced around a ton. I lived uh, in Philly for seven years, did a stint out in the Appalachian Mountains in eastern Kentucky, just sort of bounced around a bit in Pittsburgh before slowly finding my way back back to Newport in 2005. And yeah, as I said, I didn't intend for this to become a career, but it's, uh, it's sort of morphed that direction about uh, nine or 10 years ago now where I sort of found myself uh, enjoying the technology side of, of the sport and found a little bit of a niche and just kept pursuing and pushing and pushing until, as you said, the, the network sort of allowed the connections to be there to just find the next great opportunity one after another. Yeah. And that's and the technology side of thing. We'll get into that in a little bit. Cause I think there's a lot of warriors who are super interested in that side of yeah. sailing. And, and we don't really get into that very much unless you come, unless people have come on like a great lake tour where we've been on a little bit bigger boat, but you know, the only thing you need on a J 22 is a compass. And most of the time it doesn't turn on. So then you go to the one that actually is a compass. <laughs> and then by that point, it's really just figuring out where you are in the fleet, but uh, I mean, there, you, you probably don't get any interviews without somebody asking about your dad, whether or not uh, he had an interest yeah. in, in the whole like sailing career. And it sounds like you kind of like went the opposite direction, not necessarily to spite your father. I don't want to do that, but like to be in oh. the other direction of like not wanting to be in the sailing community. Yeah. My old man, uh, when I was growing up, he was uh, working in the lofts. Um, he worked for North for a long time, worked for Sobstad for a long time. And then he slowly found his way into the side of the sport, um, managing races, managing regattas. Uh, so I'd tail along with him quite frequently and, and 
just as the only opportunity for father son bonding from a divorced family. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'd, I'd travel around with him to wherever he was going for a regatta and help him out just to, just to have father son time more than anything else. Um, and enjoyed it. I mean, he was fortunate enough to have opportunities to you know, come down here and be involved with the cup on the race management side in 2000, 2003. Uh, he's done, I think four, three or four Olympics uh, managing, managing races, managing primarily for the circle for the Finn class. Um, and so his involvement in the sport at a pretty high level, while there were, uh, I guess you could say doors that had potential to be opened. I never wanted to walk through them. I didn't want, if this was going to be my career to be doing it on his coattails. And he always said, Hey, I can make connections if you wanted. And I always turned them down, just wanted to try to do it on my own merit. So yeah. the experience probably allowed me to build the skill set, but I, I tried to not take advantage of, of the opportunities in name only. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I'd say you were successful in that, Anderson. I, I like to think so. I've gotten to a pretty, pretty lucky position here so far, but yeah. Well, you don't own a restaurant yeah. and you're not slinging drinks anymore. <laughs> I mean, so that, that's not, that's not really the truth, you know? So I think there is some, some merit there that you have earned every single ounce of that. I can, I, I, I I'm a witness. I'm a witness. <laughs> hey, you remember me when, man, where it was just head, headbands every day and, and yeah, yeah, tan lines around the forehead as we were doing the bandit days. Yeah, we did have a competition one day. I don't know if anybody else actually took anybody up on it, but Anderson, I think, came up with the competition, fulfilled the competition, and won the competition to see who can get the worst sunburn. That's about how <laughs> smart we were with Bandit. And yes, but we also, of we also had, sunburn, you we also had tons of cash weighing on rocks, paper, scissors, too, if you remember. Yeah, yeah, there was actually a lot of, uh, you know, boats would end up crossing each other in sailboat racing quite frequently and there happened to always be kind of a group of people that knew each other racing on different boats and that's where your network comes across and Anderson and a group of folks decided that we would play silent rock paper scissors between the boats while we were crossing and then you had to kind of keep track of who won throughout the day kind of meaning we did very very closely but no one else really sitting on the rail really knew this was going on, except there would just be a random, you know, three to shoot. And then yeah. and we would keep track. And that this is like how serious we got on the rail um, sailing when we were going around the buoys was we were paying. There was a Swan 42 paid. Nationals. There was a Swan 42 Nationals in Newport where that probably had more competitiveness to it than the actual event. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't remember who, yeah. who won the event, but I can tell you I did not win Rock, Paper, Scissor. That did not happen. No, Pat, Pat O'Connor took $200 off me. <laughs> oh, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, all right. So then you, you, you grow up, kind of bounce around. You did some of the Olympic sailing. And what kind, of, what kind of sailing did you do on your own? I didn't do any Olympic sailing. No, no, I meant your dad was doing Olympic PRO. You were around yeah, yeah. the scene, not in the scene. Now, yeah, were but you I was only like ever doing. I was only ever doing dinghy stuff, man. Like I'd only done, I'd only done, you know, four twenties, opties, and the like through up until I went off to college, and I didn't step on a boat for probably seven years. Um, yeah, I, I was bartending in Philly, and one of the regular customers at this restaurant where I was working. Uh, you know, was talking about sailing J-22s. And I was like, hey, I haven't sailed in a really long time. You sail J-22s, if you ever need an extra, extra crew member, give me a call. And he gave me a call up and we went down racing out of the uh, Corinthian Yacht Club of Philadelphia, which is right beneath the airport. So, and right near, uh, I want to say it's a helicopter, it's a Sikorsky factory. Um, but I could be wrong on, on, on the, the brand, but they, uh, you would have these helicopters and you'd have these airplanes that would take off right over and it was, you hear about helicopter puffs. They were literal helicopter puffs that you would try <laughs> to catch on the race course to try to work your way up to the top mark in like this weeknight J-22 fleet. And it was a blast. And that's sort of how I started to fall back in love with it and wanted to, and that's, that experience alone is what inspired me to try to move on up to Newport. Cause I was like, ah, I really enjoy this. I kind of miss this. I want this to be a part of my life and wanted to find a town where you could sling drinks and make some cash that way and still have the outlet of getting out on the water and 
I mean, for me, it was either Annapolis or Newport. And I, I know one of my better friends from Annapolis is on this call and he's not going to like hearing it, but Newport was the obvious choice out of the two. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. We don't need to go there. You know, the, the person that might be writing the checks over there, I think he might have a, a different opinion about that too. Yeah, I, but, I feel comfortable making that statement now that Terry's left the room. Yeah, yeah. okay, that's good. <laughs> There's always a bit of a rivalry between the Newport and the uh, Annapolis folks. And, and I yeah. love that because that's actually more so what we talk about at Warrior Sailing, which is this network of just getting out there. Like you met somebody not through like – standing at a yacht club waiting to get on the get on a boat you met somebody in life in general that sailed yeah. that you got on the boat and then you just <clears throat> kind of decided and moved in and then when you were when you were slinging drinks at zelda's in newport your network expanded it's kind of where i met you through different things but but like it was always this corinthian fun thing to do um correct and so it's like it's a network i mean it's a network of friends and family and people that you know right i mean everywhere you go you kind of know somebody well, especially, I mean, especially at Zelda's where, you know, the, it was such just the, the quintessential yachty bar, right? With, with yeah. the IAC right next door, you know, you, you, you'd have those two spots on a Friday or Saturday night in the summertime, just filled with everybody who had been out on the water sharing the stories coming back in. And so it was, it was only natural that you'd eventually you know, meet the people who were involved in, in the sport in that town and make the connections to say, hey, you know, you're sailing J24s on Thursday nights, I'm around. You know, I don't work Thursday nights. Give me a call. I'll come on out. And next thing you know, you're yeah. sailing Thursday nights with with what now have become some of my greatest friends. You know, sailing Shields Wednesday nights in Newport, same same sort of thing. It's where I ended up meeting so many people who I've sailed with both professionally and in the Corinthian environment just by having had those experiences in the bar, just making friends. You know? Yeah. 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 Awesome. And you meet one person I mean, who introduces that. you to another and you sail, you sail with another. And then all of a sudden, you know, you step on multiple boats and the, the network slowly broadens out and it becomes this giant spider web to where here I am in, in Auckland having a coffee with a buddy of mine not two days ago who's on an opposing team who he and I have done probably more miles together than any other person that I'm friends with here in, in New Zealand. I love it. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that is what happens. It's just whatever, however far you, or however yeah. small you want to make it to, you could just go Wednesday nights here or Tuesday nights there, get back to your profession, do whatever you want to do. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. And, and do, you, do you own a boat? Uh, at the moment? No, no. I had, yeah. The only boat that I've ever, the only sailboat I've ever personally owned other than the Opti or 420 as a kid was a laser where I just hopped on and started doing uh, frostbiting in Newport. And that yeah. uh, I ran out of interest in that in probably about two and a half months. Yeah, <laughs> that's cold. Yeah, it's, it's uh, cold. Yeah, OPB, yeah. OPM. That's what I always say at the, at, the, at the camps. And I always frustrate some people and I always talk about it during these things. Other people's boats and other people's money. <laughs> we just happen to use Ralphie's. <laughs> um but uh that's awesome all right so newport you end up taking a job and then the kind of the next move besides like doing some deliveries i mean you and i sailed privateer down to get hot sauce down in um uh, in antigua i mean yep. that was the main goal we got the boat there but the main goal was to yeah, make sure but we, we were out of hot sauce at zelda's so we needed to go down and get some so sailing yeah. privateer to antigua just to get that hot sauce seemed like a, a reasonable play yeah, yeah. So yeah. we were, we did it that. It was not and our then, boat, and it was someone else's money. See, yeah, and uh, you probably got reimbursed for the for the hot sauce as well. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, it was good. Um, so then you take a job. I mean, your next move is pretty much sail Newport, right? Yeah. So the uh, uh, through Zelda's, I ended up meeting and volunteering with Sail Newport, doing um, some volunteer stuff for them over the course of the years uh, that I was at Zelda's and they uh, needed somebody to help out when they had the America's Cup World Series come to Newport in 2012. Um, so in late 2011, they offered me a position to, to hop on on their staff and help them organize events. And you know, I was pushing, uh, pushing 30 at the time and was realizing rather quickly that opening my own restaurant was something that probably wasn't going to be happening anytime soon. 
And uh, so I decided to just pull the trigger and make a make a bit of a change. Took a bit of a risk and and started out at Sail Newport. And I didn't really know where it was going to go. I, I started working there, managing the regattas. Did that for three years, and at the same time, I realized that uh, you could actually start making money professionally, actually sailing with the skill set that I'd been pushing by just focusing on the technology side of the sport. And so in 2013, uh, I ended up leaving, or 2014 rather, ended up leaving Sail Newport and been just doing the, the pro sailing gig ever since, where it's been bouncing between uh, a few different pretty consistent sailing programs and getting involved in the last two Volvo races. And now this experience here where I'm finding myself with American Magic. Yeah. And so technology is like something, obviously you, what you guys are dealing with technology, which we'll get into a little bit uh, brief subject because <laughs> otherwise we'd be talking to people at Airbus and they'd be like, what? Um, but technology on sailboats. So you helped me initially with just calibration of instruments on bigger boats and kind of getting the wind direction. So on big boats, most warriors kind of know this, but some people don't know the technology is crazy now, just like the fact that we can talk and you're in New Zealand and it's like, you're kind of sitting right next to me. Um, and uh, the, the fact that the technology has, has gone to a point where you, you have wind instruments on the boat and it can get as complicated as you're getting with foiling and that sort of thing. But in a general sense, they help to eliminate a lot of the unknowns in sailing that you would have to do by feel or just by the windex at the top of the mast that that magic you know no go zone and the magic whiteboard that i've got at my classes is a lot more complicated where it actually gives you numbers and gives you um, estimated routing and, and so what other technology sort of thing obviously the routing is big for you but what, what other technology are you talking yeah. about yeah well i mean the the basics of it you know when you throw a, a, a simple uh, instrumentation package on a boat. I mean, it's other than your GPS derived speed and heading, pretty much everything else, or uh, pretty much everything else that's on the boat is actually a derived variable, a calculated variable, or a variable that has some sort of calibration involved in it. You know, you, you think of the flow of the water over the hull of the boat that spins a paddle wheel. Well, the flow of that water and the speed of that water is. Uh, influenced by how much the boat's healing over or how much the boat has in pitch, bow up, bow down. Um, you know, the, the Windex at the top of the rig that's spinning and telling you what your wind direction is, well, that's only reading the wind as the, as the mast is moving through the, through the water. Like that's only reading you back a measured, um, a measured variable. So to actually calculate out what the true wind direction is and the true wind speed is, well, it's not just actually what's being read up there, it's what's being read up there, but then factoring in the vectors of where's the boat moving? Is the boat sliding sideways from current? Is the boat sliding sideways from leeway? How is the boat headed relative to its course over ground? You know, there's, there's an, a, a vast quantity of variables that actually have to go into the calculation to where when you actually see a true wind direction and a true wind speed readout on a boat, that's the back end of a long line of mathematical calculations there that um, is, is pretty complicated to get accurate. I mean, every boat, whether you're at the cup level or whether you're you know, just a, a Melgus 32 with a very simple package on it, every boat's going to have to deal with some, some of that level of complexity. And I found myself with, with an IT background pretty naturally understanding the math behind it and uh, working pretty hard to, to understand the, the calibrations that were necessary to make that all work. Because at the end of the day, you know, if you're trying to win a sailboat race, if you can't rely on the numbers that you've got in front of you, it's gonna make it pretty hard for you to make good decisions to get in front of your competitor and win. I mean, it's like anything else, if you've got a piece of instrumentation and you can't trust the data, if it's garbage in, it's gonna be garbage out. Yeah. Which the yeah. best thing about instruments on boats is that you throw them into a saltwater environment, so they rarely work anyway. So the calculations don't need. To know. I mean, I love it because you can just call it shear. It's like, oh, shear. Yeah, that was the problem. I knew that that wasn't right. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's always there's always an excuse, <laughs> but I try yeah, to make yeah, sure that with the instrumentation yeah, oh, well, that that's not the excuse. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. obviously things have changed quite a bit in the time that you were helping me with banded instruments. It's kind of like. 
the calculations and the accuracy of things and being able to change the inputs has been, I mean, mind boggling, right? I mean, it's, it's. Yeah. But at the end of the day, Ben, like still we're most of the sport still operates off some pretty antiquated technology. You know, at the top of the rig, you've got spinning cups that just spin around a magnet and you're just sensing one magnet spinning around the other and it generates an electrical charge and you're able to derive from that what the wind speed is. And then there's another, the Windex that does exactly the same thing to be able to derive for you the relative wind angle of the breeze. And then you have to have your compass to then calculate out what the actual breeze direction is. I mean, the paddle wheel itself is the same thing. It's just a wheel that just gets pushed around like an old school water wheel. And that's all it is. And so, yeah. you know, you're just calculating revolutions on a, on a hertz scale and then okay, well, this many hertz equals this many knots, and all of a sudden you've got a boat speed. But it's the, the basics of the inputs are still pretty antiquated technology. The back-end math behind it and the variability that you can have in the control of all of those calculations, that's expanded tremendously in the last decade. But yeah. still, we're, you know, even here at the cup, we've got a wand at the top of the rig that's got little cups that are just spinning around in circles. Yeah, you know, our boat's that still our boat's. Like, Oh man, the cup's gone on that thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, awesome. We still make this. We still make the. We still make the same jokes where it's like, oh, it's a no wind day. Yeah, I can count the revolutions of the cups at the top of the rig. You know, it's the same yeah. thing when you're on a Melgus Thirty Two or whether you're on a cup boat. We have the same problems, and you know, it's just the the mathematical capabilities when you're uh, at this level, or even if you're at just something somebody with a BNG Five Thousand system, you. Know, the mathematical capabilities that are there now are are vastly superior to where they were a decade ago, but the inputs are still the same. Yeah, that's cool. We did get a, we got a question from Susie Leach that says, do you think that the uh, instruments from this AC will eventually trickle down as far as the technology goes? Like once you guys are done with this sort of cup, do you think that some of the technology will trickle down mm -hmm. to us regular folk? There are elements of it that you hope would. There's elements of it that clearly won't. I mean, there's there's definitely a joke out there every once in a while when you see the boat foiling at, at 40 plus knots. You know, I, I look at look at Dusty Burrell, who's standing right next to me on the chase boat. I'm like, can you feel the trickle down? I don't really feel the trickle down. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, but who would have who thought, right? I mean, who would have thought the Amoka 60s? Did you see the, the pepper? Exactly. I mean, like who would have yeah. thought that they'd be just foiling straight bow up, worried that the stern's going hit to the, hit the back of them? water because the bow's so far up i mean what does it feel like yeah. on that boat what the hell's going on i mean it might be nice to sleep on that boat right <laughs> well who, we have a rougher knows, ride yeah. on the chase we have a rougher ride on the chase boats than the guys do on the 75 man they're just comfortably out of the water you know maintaining stable flight they just there's this nice little hum and you know we're bashing along just trying to keep up with them and, and, and but, Susie, yeah. i I promise that I'll get to the last, the, the other question she has, what will be your, what will your legacy be? And we'll, we'll get to that because I already have my opinion on what your legacy be, but that I could have a different opinion, you know, I mean, we've had different, different experiences. Um, but so from the PRO type thing, you're working with a couple teams, it kind of gets you into, I guess, a little bit of the weather routing and routing and what you did for the, for the um, American um, Volvo Ocean Race teams. Because obviously what you're doing with the cup translates to small or inshore racing, right? I mean, yeah. smaller meaning the five footers going 40 knots, like it's still big, but we're talking like offshore point to point things that are distance wise. Where did, how does that technology, what was your role with um, the Amer with the Volvo teams and, and how so, did that translate? Your experience? Um, so basically, you know, with, with a lot of the sailing that I was doing on big boats, I was, getting pretty heavily inv invested in the navigation side, which, you know, if you're going to be a, a navigator on a, on a big boat these days, you got to sort of have your hands in multiple pots. You need to understand the instrumentation. You need to understand how to make things calculated, uh, uh, how to make things calibrated properly. Um, but then there's also the meteorology side of it, the, uh, the weather routing side of it. And that was where my skill set was minimal. Um, but I went out and uh, started taking classes in meteorology to try to, understand that more um, and simultaneously was taking classes on data analytics um, so that I could break down performance instrumentation data and understand how to make make uh, 
the, the numbers that you can get off of a boat useful to derive better speed and better performance. Uh, and so those two elements combined nicely into a role that was necessary for Charlie Enright with his team in Alva Medica in 2014, where they needed somebody who had both of that, who could help Will Oxley on shore in planning the routes for each of the legs of their races and also manage the analytics side of the program to try to make the most out of the Volvo 65s, which at the time was a, was a brand new class, which not a lot of people knew. Um, well, nobody knew how to sail at a, at a very high level when they first came out. So I ended up applying both of those skill sets in, in that program. And Charlie asked me to come around for, for a second lap when uh, he went on with Vestas 11th hour racing. And I did basically the same thing a second time around. Um, and those two experiences were, were massive, um, you know, breaking down a 30 day leg into a digestible 10 to 15 page data report for, for the sailing team was, uh, an absolute joy because you're taking 30 days worth of data and trying to crunch it into usable numbers to sit there and put a recipe together for each subsequent leg for those guys to say, here's where you're going fast. Here's where you're going slow. And. You know, you're trying to translate feel into variables so that everybody who is driving the boat could hit the same numbers and, and make the boat go faster, more consistently. And we saw regular improvement throughout um, as a result of, of that work. It was pretty satisfying. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, and so this, this is about the time you got your family, right? Yeah. 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 No, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I decided to propose to my wife while we were going around the world with Alba Medica, uh, literally as she was driving me to the airport to go to Abu Dhabi for two weeks. Wow, man. <laughs> I, mean, I, I would imagine that some, maybe some of the veterans had the same sort of feeling like, well, I mean, now's the time I'll be back. Um, so. I, you know, I, I've never, I've never claimed to be a romantic and, and the story just proves proves it to be so that there we were driving up I-95 and I'm like, Hey, can we just pull the car over for a second? <laughs> hey, man. Yeah, you know, it, it's, you're, you're consistent. Well, I, I, I made the error then I picked up the ring, uh, on, on Christmas day. And then she was driving me to the airport the day after Christmas. And I realized, well, this is going to go one of three ways. Either I propose to her now, I leave the ring in the glove box and she borrows my car for the next two weeks. So she'll find it or I bring the way, ring all the way to Abu Dhabi and back, and that's just not practical. So I guess now so is as good a time data, as any. Data, data analytics say, well, you sh I think that by feel, we should <laughs> probably do this right now. How, how can we get this, uh, push this back right now? We should do that. So yeah, exactly. the thing about the Volvo race, if you have a family, you get to go around the world. Yeah. Yeah, and and they were the 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 wife was able to join for for a few of the stopovers. Obviously, having a stopover in Newport as our, in our hometown was uh, really helpful. <laughs> uh, but then, yeah, for the second go around, like her and and our first kid were able to come with us to to Hong Kong, uh, and we ended up staying in Hong Kong for an extra couple of weeks. It's just a nice family vacation. And now the the wife and now we have two kids. They're they're here with us here in Auckland and enjoying enjoying cup family life. But there was a lot of time away from family. I mean, with the yeah. Volvo. No, there's a huge yeah, amount of time away from whether family. You're a sailor, whether you're a sailor or you're on the shore, it's a yeah. one of those, I think it's one of those familiar kind of similarities between sailors and veterans that I've always try and make these kind of like, how, are, how does this work? Like it works so well. And I've been trying to figure out what, why it works so well is that like, that's part of it. A part of it is that juggling your profession with being away from home and having people back home. I mean, it's, it's a tough, I mean, obviously our, you know, the seriousness of what we're doing might be a little bit, you know, less and, and what we're, what we have going on and <laughs> really, you know, trying to put us in dangerous situations, whereas we just do it on ourself, um, being on the boat, but it's a lot of time away. Yeah, it's a ton of time away and it is very hard for the wife and the kids, you know, even even when we're here, there's still mornings when I go off to work where the kid, uh, where, where, where kid one who's used to seeing me saying, all right, dad is going off to work and dad is going to be gone for a couple of weeks um, or even a month at times, you know, still here that um, he sees me go off to work and he doesn't want to see me go. And it's it's hard. And for sure, during the last two Volvos, when or it's the last follow when, when I'm just going off for, for a month at a time. No, it was, 
it was miserable for me. It was miserable for him, but it does allow us the opportunity to appreciate when we do have time together that much more. And yeah, you know, me, me and both my kids are, are super tight as a, as a result, because we, we really make sure that the time that we have together and my wife as well, we make sure that the time that we have together as, as a squad is, uh, yeah. is, is as optimal as possible. We really work hard to yeah. make sure that we do as much as we can together and enjoy it. Yeah. It's awesome. I mean, the sport does that and she sails, she's still sailing or has she got time to do that or is she? And she hasn't really done all that much in the last bit. I keep, uh, it's been probably a year and a half since she last did her, her last regatta. Um, but yeah. well, I mean, with yeah, young she, kids, it's really hard. I mean, obviously, I mean, she's definitely a better sailor than the two of us. So we, combined. Yeah. Yes. Oh, no, yes, she, absolutely. She reminds me almost nightly that she wins in the terms of quantity of world championships. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We don't even go there with some of our friends. Fine. Like, yeah, no, no, yeah. Like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that brings us in, I mean, it's 634, so just got a little bit more time, but like, uh, well, here. Um, what, what do you got now? All right, so now you're in Auckland. You're with American Magic. We have yeah. been sworn to not talk much or take pictures. In fact, we've got to move that camera or move that computer screen in the background. We're not supposed to have any pictures of any sailboats. It, the America's Cup is the America's Cup. And some warriors might not really know what that is. Of what you're doing there, what is the challenge? And, and kind of explain a little bit of what you're doing. Well, I mean, the, the cup for its whole history has been the pinnacle of, of technology in the sport. Um, it's always been pushing, pushing the boundaries. And here now with these boats, it feels like you're pushing the boundaries of physics harder than they've ever been pushed before. I mean, we have uh, just taken delivery of our second boat, but we're still sailing our first boat for a few more weeks, um, which for us has been a boat that we've been using as a development machine. Uh, testing any and all concepts that we can come up with in-house to try to help us learn and understand how to make these boats operate at their highest potential that we can then apply to our second boat, which will be our race boat, um, to ultimately go up against the Kiwis and, and win the cup. Um, but it is a, a massive undertaking. You know, I, I say we've got Airbus as a sponsor and we've got a couple of their engineers who have been uh, in-house just integrated with the team from day one. And they say that the amount of development that they see in us in two months would normally take them about two years at Airbus to push through. So the, the rate of improvement um, just has to be exponential uh, because you go out there and you, you realize that you don't know where you are on the scale of zero to 100% of your potential performance. You have no way of knowing because nobody's ever done it on these boats before. So you just have to butt your head against the upper limits of what you've had for performance in the past and just try to find every opportunity to, to expand beyond that, whether that's through efficiency and how the systems of the boat are designed or logically controlled um, to how the sails are designed and how the sails integrate with one another, because the mainsail is this twin skin setup that's entirely unique to these boats to how you control the foils, which I mean, you think of how a normal keel works as your, your lever arm to provide writing moment. You know, this thing has writing moment of the entirety of the hull, which is to windward of your leeward foil, which is down in the water. So your pivot point is out here and you get six tons of hull. You get one ton of this claw that's up in the air. That's your windward foil that's raised. And all of a sudden you're generating a ton of writing moment downforce against a very tiny pivot point with foil wings that are the size of ironing boards. Like just how it all works is just mind boggling. So, uh, you know, some, your... Go ahead. I mean, I think, I think some of the people, so what I always get, it's really funny is that you always get this question and it's like, have you done an America's cup? It's like, well, um, no, the, the 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 thing about the America's Cup and what it means is a it's a match race between two syndicates or two programs. One program owns the cup, meaning they've won it and they keep it and they decide where they sail, what you sail in, and how the sailing is going to get done. 
And then a bunch of the challengers that put up the cash and the money and the technology show up to race against each other to see who can actually challenge the, the winner. Um, Correct. And so, so the, the Kiwis own the cup at the current moment. They're sailing in New Zealand. You're there. You're getting ready to challenge. How many challengers do you have? So we have two other challengers. We on on paper there's a third, but they're uh, have pretty much a zero percent chance of actually showing up. I don't see how Team Stars and Stripes could still come together with the time that they have left. Um, but so it's us, it's the Brits and the Italians, um, and you know, there it's not a lot of challengers, sure, but it's similar to what it was in 2012 where. You know, the challenges that you do have, any one of the three teams has potential to have their day and, and beat out the other two. But it's the yeah. ultimate home field advantage. I mean, you described it right. The Kiwis own the cup, and as a result, they get the luxury of deciding what boats we race in, when we race, and and the format of that racing. And they wouldn't make decisions relative to that unless they gave it enough forethought to – make sure that it was to their advantage as best as they could possibly make it. I mean, they had the design of the boat for a good period of time before they released the design to the challenging teams. So already they were down the path towards designing the boat and you know, they, they designed a really good boat one. We designed a really good boat one, but definitely there's going to be no, no question which one is our boat one versus which one is our boat two when our boat two comes out. <laughs> You know, just yeah. because you've we've learned I mean, so much over such a short period of time. I just, just imagine. I mean, just the technology we saw last year when we were in Newport, Terry uh, just graciously invited us to come check out the Warriors that were in town oh, yeah, for right. sale. For, we went and checked out the base and got a sneak peek of the boat um, in person and got to sit in this, you know, technology trailer, you know, that was like full of, you know, just, I mean, it's just craziness, all the stuff that's going on there. And, and it's so cool to see because it, it's so innovative and it is what it is going to be. Uh, Ray Wolf wants to know what's going to happen to B1, uh, boat one, once boat two is sailing. Um, well, once, you once boat two is sailing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you guys want it? <laughs> no, hey, the, uh... I, can't, I can't speak for Ralph. Okay. I have no idea. <laughs> Your first training 30 foot, the mule did belong to the sailing foundation. And that is where true. You guys got the boat, which is pretty cool linked to the whole thing is that the sailing foundation that provides boats for warrior sailing provided the original platform Mule. um to you guys for the original technology was probably one of the first ones to get up on the monohull foil right i mean one of the first which, man which if you if you look back on what we did with the mule and how for us that was just such a, a wonderful machine for just going out and just trying everything because when you build something for the 75 scale that when you build it full scale, the cost isn't just two to one compared to half scale, <laughs> right? Oh, so yeah, to yeah. have to have the mule to mess around with and to try every last little concept that we could to throw the ball as far out and try to chase after it was was a godsend for us because we ended up getting uh, an untold number of days. I think we ended up selling the mule close to 90, 95 days, something like that of of just proper hard on sailing to to learn and to develop and to pull out of that and see the development from that into boat one and then to now see the the push from what we've done with boat one into boat two is is even better but what's going to happen with boat one when we're done i mean we'll we'll keep her in a ready state but our intention is to race boat two yeah I mean, that makes sense. It's an evolution of things you don't need to race exactly. the mule if you did if you did and you won we'll give her the credit you know I think that I think you know. I can yeah. tell you that we'll take the mule back. I guess. I mean, that sounds like fun. <laughs> we were Where actually looking it? through some photos the other day. I, I'm honestly not sure. It's not here, but I'm not positive where it's, it's located. I think it's. I think it's still in Rhode Island. No. If it's at, if it's at KP, I mean, full circle. <laughs> um, that's awesome. So, see, you guys, you guys are now you're 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 kind of getting boat two ready. Um, and we're, you know, you're just sailing, sailing, sailing. Obviously today you have today off, right? I mean, weather wise or just was that planned? Oh, it was planned this week. You know, we've got a, a, a certain number of days left that we've got targeted for boat one, um, with 
at this stage in boat one, we're not trying to eke out every last moment of performance so much as we're just trying to make sure that we get all of the best data out of that boat with the different projects that we have going on that we hope to apply to boat two. Yeah. At the end yeah. of the day, when you're this close to, to finishing up sailing your first boat, it's, it's not so much how fast you can get that boat around the race course as much as it's trying to maximize your learning potential for what you can apply to the second boat. So we're just picking and choosing our days based off of what we have on the docket for things to learn and going hard on those days when we can. Like yesterday, I think we had a session on the water that was close to uh, close to seven hours from dock to dock and just sent it. It was wow. arguably one of our more productive days as a result. Yeah. That's a lot. That's, that's a yeah. lot of concentration. That's crazy. Yeah. Is, and I mean, is, the, is the Kiwi boat out? Are you guys getting close to each other or? They've been out. Um, so since we got here to Auckland, I think we've done just shy of 20 days on the water and they've probably been out uh, on the same day, uh, seven or eight of those days. Um, and yeah, we've gotten close to one another a couple of times. Yeah. You see one boat stopped. It's very tempting to do a flyby. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, we're not allowed. Yeah, we're not allowed to do organized lineups though with this cup. So it's it's against the rules for us to for us to two boat test. Um, it's against the rules for us to coordinate any testing with any other the other teams, whether that be the challenger or the defender. So okay. you're sort of all left to go out there on your own. Um, and when you do two boat test, it has to happen only in the virtual world, only with with simulation. That's the only option that you have. Okay, well, that's yeah. pretty cool. I mean, it's hard yeah. not to get two of the same sort of boats, you know, um, hey, how we doing? You know, I don't know. Yeah. Everybody stop. <laughs> 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 um, all right. So I usually ask kind of the last couple questions here. And for, if I don't get to, thank you, Anderson, for taking the time. It's, and it's great to see you. No and it's, yeah, it's, it's good awesome. to see you, buddy. Yeah. It's like, uh, like the last couple of times we've been in Newport, we just like catch up really quick. And it's like how it happens with friends. You're like, oh man, and you're off kind of doing things. <laughs> <laughs> um, dragon warriors to wherever we could go, uh, or can't go and just show up. Um, I guess, uh, one of the things is the network and developing that network and what we find that there's a lot of people that are interested in sailing and might not know how to stay involved after our camps. If you could give somebody some advice about sailing and just in general and how to stay involved and meet that network, what, what do people need to do? Uh. I think it's just a matter of just putting yourself out there. I mean, you, you, it's there, there, there's not a, there's not a weeknight racing program in the country that you don't hear of people struggling to find crew. Right. And so it's, it's a matter of just showing up and being present. You know, the, uh, I guess my, I guess my years of dating taught me the benefits of understanding rejection. <laughs> you know, there's going to be plenty of times you show up on the dock and somebody's going to say, no, we're good. But if you just keep at it, you'll be <laughs> you'll be hardened and you, you'll be eventually hot, welcome on and you know it doesn't matter it never matters to me who I sail with it never matters to me what the boat is you know whether it be a, a shields with somebody who's never gone sailing before on a Wednesday night or whether it be up at this level like I just you, know, you treat everybody welcoming and and you'll find that very quickly that generally the sailing community is one of the most welcoming communities you can find on the planet because we need each other. Like, you know, there's, there's very few boats that are out there that you see tooling around that are just sailed solo. Yeah, they exist, but most boats, you need somebody else. So you, you need to be willing to, to, to take people on and give them a shot. And so, you know, I, I'd be nowhere if I hadn't just said to the guy in Philly, Hey, if you ever need crew on a J on a J 22 on a Wednesday night, I'd be happy to do it. Yeah. yeah. I never would have lit that spark and, started the snowball that's just built to where it is so it's just a matter of showing up and being present and saying hey i may not be the best sailor in the world but i'm i'm willing to give it a shot and i want to go out and have a good time yeah and i, I really like your comment about rejection and that it can also go the other way where where well i mean it's funny first of all but second of all it it's it's also goes the other way if you get on a boat and i'm sure that you've had this experience too and i know that i have plenty of experience of getting on a boat where I realized on the way out that it was not the right crew and not the right group for me. And it might've been for somebody yeah. else. And you can just yeah. drop it, go to the next. If it's not right, figure something else out. I've been pretty lucky There's finding always... you know, like 
clay and you know and teams like chippewa and teams like privateer and then bandit and you know there's like a bunch of really you know good i've lucked out in my my sailing career to find the right people but i think that you just you just gotta let it let it go but in but for, by the same token you know or for as much as there's um always going to be another boat looking for crew loyalty is always rewarded as well you know if you're if you're loyal to a boat loyal to a program you know that, that's that goes a long way. So it's, it's a give and take. Yeah. And I, I agree with that too. I had a boss that always told me it doesn't matter what boat you sail on, it's who you sail with, or it's yeah. not what, what, what boat you work on, you know, it's who the owner is, you know, and we've had luck in that with the, the fishers and some people that have been wonderful folks involved in sailing and it's about the right group, you know, and there, mm -hmm. you can do everything from cruising to racing to America's cup. Um, so I think it's just, it's a, such an awesome thing. And so the other questions are mostly associated to people who have sailed with the program specifically at like a camp. And obviously between the Volvo and a couple things like the America's cup getting in the way of your schedule a little bit that obviously haven't worked out for us. We really appreciate it. Um, but we will get you out here after you guys bring the cup back to the States. Um, we love, 100%. and it was always, always invited to come out and coach and hang out. Uh, and get involved in the program. Um, but I think the question's really um, about the similarities between sailors and the camaraderie that you get um, in sailing as you would have in veteran population. And because you haven't worked with our program specifically, um, with those kind of questions are a little bit different, but we would love to have you come out and come coach. I'd be honored, man. I'd absolutely love to do that. I know we've we've spoken a ton in the past about doing that, and for sure, I, I remember I've done done some remote stuff for you guys relative to a fifty two, and and, and I'm you know, what you've done with this program is fantastic, Ben, and I'm happy to contribute in any way that I can. Awesome! I just can't wait to get you out. It's gonna be a blast. And um, let's see, there's also you know so many questions running through my head, but none of those are are very very appropriate. <laughs> Uh, and that so are you going to be are you going to be the uh, New York Yacht Club American Magic representative for Warrior Sailing that's going to push Terry to provide at least one on-site visit in New Zealand you know it could come with a two-week quarantine we're pretty good at that I mean we've already done it. <laughs> where maybe we could put it out there you know as an auction for uh, some folks to either maybe they don't get to ride on the boat okay like that's safe for yeah. like celebrities and people you know i mean i think veterans should give the opportunity but um maybe on the maybe on the the chase boat with you guys or something i mean so you know should we write something up for terry as a proposal officially put onto the warrior watch that we're looking for a couple spots <laughs> there's there's never never any harm in asking the question man Okay. It well, it's, it's, officially, it's officially asked now, and I know it's not your call, <laughs> but that's why I like asking people that can't really make decisions because then it's not my fault either. Um, but maybe, maybe we'll pressure Terry. He did invite us out to Pensacola. It was nice, but I was thinking New yeah. Zealand would be, <laughs> would be, um, I'm, I, I like waiting it out for yeah. the best opportunity that we have. So, you know, <laughs> Just put it out there. We're just putting it out there. Warrior Sailing is just putting it out there that we'd like to, you know, show your patriotism. You are the American team. That is true. Um, Oracle never gave us an invite. Tried with Romy. You know, he couldn't make the call either. I just don't know if that flag on, on your shoulder there, if that is something that you guys would like to offer, you know, an opportunity for warriors to get out there. So, um, hey Ben, you should you should have us pay to go on the boat instead, so you get the money for the warriors. Well, I know who that is. That's Cat, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll pay. Uh, I'll pay. Yeah. yeah, I know a lot of people would pay a lot. I'm trying to get a ride for the warriors. <laughs> um, How here, about I both? Got, I got, I got one. I got one question because we got time for one one question, and then guys, I can I can float some of these questions a little bit. Um, uh, John Thompson asked Sam Greenfield the same question. Um, what is your biggest takeaway from being around guys like Terry Hutchinson and Hap and Doug and Dean and like some of the you know bigger guys in the sport? Is there like one particular takeaway? Yeah, the the most obvious one is that just hard work's rewarded. Like, <laughs> yeah. It, it, none of the guys that were, uh, I mean, to put it 
to put it bluntly, I'm still in awe that I'm allowed to sit in the room with some of these people sometimes. Like I walk, I got a meeting to walk into here in, in about a half hour and, and they're going to allow me to actually contribute. And I still don't know why. I've been wondering why <laughs> for the better part of 18 months since I joined this team. Um, but you, you walk in and you're just surrounded by legends and you, you, you do, you start to think, well, okay, well, how did they become just these legendary individuals? And you, you see the same characteristics in all of them, that they're just willing to put their head down and do, do the hard work. You know, a lot of them, yeah. a lot of the guys who have great success in this sport, they did sort of follow the, uh, what was it? The, uh, the captain Ron mentality, you know, you do, you do a bad job, but you do a bad job. Well, you'll get a better job. <laughs> and you do that job. Well, you'll get a better job after that. And you just keep working up the ranks and slowly but surely you find that you're, you're in a room with Dean Barker and he's trusting you to give your advice on, on how we think the boat should be sailed. And I'm still sitting there giving my opinion, but it's like, why are you listening to me? (laughs) (laughs) I'd say I like humble, right? They're all very humble. Oh, they are. Yeah, for sure. For sure, and and extremely approachable. You know, the there's, I think, uh, intimidation is often something that we put on ourselves, and there's no reason to be intimidated by a lot of the guys that I'm dealing with here on a daily basis, none whatsoever. And they're willing to take take ideas and give them good thoughts, and and give it good, give it good potential. And so we'll we'll end on a really important a really important question. Um, yeah. Patriots post Brady. What's your prediction? <laughs> well, don't cry. Okay. We don't need you to cry right now. It's not like, it's not really that sad that he's gone. I mean, I know that you're really sad. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, I think they're going to do just fine. <laughs> I think they're going to do yeah. just fine. I think they're going to do oh, just I- fine. If it, if it comes down to their weather forecast, they're going to do just fine. <laughs> I'm spoken like a forecaster. All right. Um, Anderson, I really appreciate it. Um, I know you got a bunch of work to do and a bunch of a bunch of very important advice to give some very important people. Um, we can we can let you go for now. If you uh, warriors, if you want to email me questions specifically for Anderson so that you know in all of his downtime, he might be able to answer some of those or I could shoot him a, a quick question. Um, but I appreciate everyone and uh, zooming in and, and it's always been, been awesome. Good to catch up with you. Say hi to the fam, Anderson. And I will, buddy. I'm going to go eat some dinner and uh, we will catch up soon. Good luck with all that. Thanks, man. We'll catch up soon. All right. See you. Bye, guys.